What is your foreign policy? If you're in this audience, you're probably thinking about Canada's foreign policy. Maybe you're thinking about peacekeeping, free trade agreements, climate change, the United States. Trudeau is about to unveil a new defense policy after months and months of public consultations. Yet there has been no similar exercise done on the foreign policy side. Under the Harper government, there was a defense policy statement, but no foreign policy statement. So I guess it's up to us, individual citizens, to define our own foreign policy preferences. Foreign policy is about how governments engage internationally. To uphold foreign policy principles, you need sound diplomacy, you need aid dollars for international development, and sometimes you need to protect these principles with military force. And it's this last scenario that I want to discuss with you today by asking which principles should we defend on the international stage? Which countries should we be willing to send troops into harm's way for? To explore these questions, I want to think about events of the recent past. In 2014, we witnessed the territorial aggression of Ukraine by Russia to protect Russian-speaking minorities, according to Putin. Now, Canada is under no obligation to protect Ukraine. Ukraine is not a member of NATO. Ukraine is not protected by Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, NATO's founding treaty, which promises mutual defense in case of an attack. Now, there are other countries, NATO countries, who also have Russian-speaking minorities on their territory. Think about the Baltic states. Can anyone tell me where Adagi is? Well, it's in Latvia, and it's where the Canadian Armed Forces will be deployed to this spring. The United States, Germany, the UK are doing something similar by sending forces to Estonia, Lithuania, Poland. These deployments should be understood through the prism of collective defense. Canada and its 27 other NATO allies are bound together by this pledge. Now, it's not the first time that Canadian troops are going to Europe. Vimy's centennial anniversary is a reminder of that. Are we inching closer to World War III? Think about the impact of such a war with today's technology. Armed drones, smart bombs, stealth fighters, and of course, nuclear weapons are still around. Worrying, indeed. Which is all the more reason not to be passive observers of foreign policy. NATO allies, including Canada, have been used to following the US lead for so long. But now, with an ill-conceived grand strategy under President Donald Trump, look no further than Twitter, it's time for Canada to start identifying foreign policy priorities and defense capabilities to match. And they go hand in hand, by the way. Our elected officials are meant to identify foreign policy priorities, and these priorities are supposed to shape the types of defense capabilities that we need. But how do we know where to invest if there are no clear foreign policy objectives? How do we know what to buy with our hard-earned dollars when budgets are always so tight? In the military, at least, there are forecasting exercises to help us think through these questions. By comparing alternative scenarios, we're able to identify potential missions, defense capabilities, and training requirements. Now, I've had the opportunity to take part in these forecasting exercises with both the Canadian Army and the US Army, and I always learn a lot. They go a little something like this. I want everyone here to imagine two 
alternative futures. The first one, which we'll call the perfect green world, is a world where technological innovation is supporting economic growth in a sustainable way, and the world's problems are addressed by states working collectively. The other world we'll call the hopeless world. And in this world, there's acute resource scarcity. There are pockets of instability in every single region of the world. And there's profound distrust between states, which makes international cooperation almost impossible. In this world, Canada is targeted by resource-starved adversaries. Let's face it, Canada is rich but vulnerable. And in the hopeless world, Canada cannot rely on Uncle Sam, the bodyguard. By contrast, in the perfect green world, Canada is primarily focused on upholding international institutions and international law. The Canadian Armed Forces would be called upon to respond to environmental disasters and humanitarian crises. So we would be primarily focused on disaster assistance, much like they did two years ago in the Philippines. Under that scenario, the military needs a diverse toolkit, needs to work very closely with other government partners and NGOs. But you do, not, you do not need a very large military force, and you certainly do not need a fifth-generation stealth fighter jet. But you better hope and pray that the world does not change. In the hopeless world, Canada is being targeted because of its abundant resources, water, and breathable air. Remember, this is a world where there is competition between states. These states pursue their very narrow interests and where resources are rare and extremely valuable. Under this scenario, Canada would need a much more important land component to protect critical infrastructure and coastlines, a much bigger naval presence, perfect surveillance across Canada's very vast territory. Canada would need probably to triple its military, at least, and to invest in high-tech weapon systems. Does this sound expensive? You bet. But Canada would be facing a threat to its core interests, its sovereignty, its territorial integrity. Now, the point of comparing these two worlds is to understand that international events evolve really quickly and that they are very often outside of your control. The rub is that procurement cycle, meaning the time between when you identify a capability that you need, then you buy it, and then it becomes operational, can take decades. And because we cannot afford to be reactive, we hedge our bets. We try to find the overlap between the perfect world and the hopeless world. In both worlds, you need a respectable, well-trained military to protect foreign policy objectives. Otherwise, your only option is to follow or be submissive when challenged. Let's bring this back to the challenges that we're facing today. There are enduring conflicts, and the international community is divided on how to respond. Think about the Islamic State militants in Iraq and Syria. Think about Russia and Ukraine. Think about North Korea's mood swings or tensions in the East and South China Sea. With such pressing global problems, why is it so hard for Canadian citizens to engage in this foreign policy debate? I think that much of this dithering in foreign policy is due to the fact that most of us who have not served in the military have never asked ourselves what we would be willing to fight for. And I don't mean that figuratively. I don't mean tweet-shaming Boko Haram or dumping an ice bucket on your head. 
I mean really fighting. Fighting knowing that you might die in the process. So I want to go back to the questions I posed earlier, and this time I want us to think about it on a more personal level. What would you be willing to fight for? Which principles would you be willing to die to uphold? And which countries deserve the protection of those security assurances? When you put it in those terms, foreign policy becomes a high-stakes game. And this brings me to my last point. I believe that military interventions should be as costly as possible. Not because we want to mismanage or waste money, no. But because it should imply a sacrifice. I'm very partial to the argument that when we borrow money to fund wars, or when we rely on an all-voluntary professional military force to do the fighting, the average citizen does not feel the cost of war. The average citizen does feel the cost of war when we're doing the fighting or when we're feeling a significant financial strain. And when that's the case, then we pay much greater attention to foreign policy and demand accountability for decisions involving the use of force. Now, I'm not advocating for a war tax, and I'm not advocating for conscription. But I am advocating for greater engagement on foreign policy. And the way that we can do that is by making these decisions our business. And here I'm going to refer to another cost distinct from blood and treasure, which is a personal cost. Politicians can be lampooned for ill-conceived foreign policy designs. Think Iran-Contra, think the Iraq War of 2003. But average citizens won't find their face on the front page of the newspaper if a foreign policy goes wrong. But we can take greater ownership, however. And to do that, you got to put yourself out there. Here's how. Step one, pick a foreign policy issue that you're interested in. Step two, study both sides of the issue like you are preparing for a debate. Step three, find at least two people that you can discuss the issue with, and they may not agree with you. Step four, articulate that position publicly, either on social media, on a blog, or in the opinion pages of your favorite newspaper. Step five, update your position as new information becomes available. And step six, repeat with the same issue or a new one. By doing that, you are doing your part to help democratize foreign policy. Challenge your social networks, both online and offline, to think about the kind of world they want to live in. By taking a public stance on an issue, you are becoming a stakeholder, and you will begin to feel a closer tie to the decisions that are made by our political leaders. So I hope that today you answer the call for deeper engagement on foreign policy. In fact, I hope that you now see this as part of your civic duty. As a parting thought, I will take the easy way out and quote Albert Einstein. Peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. Now be part of shaping that understanding. Thank you.